Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you for coming to another MS Views and News program. For those that don't know, there are several people in this room that have never been to one of our programs. And what we do is we simply provide educational programs. This one started just on the internet, but we started doing these live programs. And this year alone, we've held, this is our 38th program this year. This week, it's our third program. Last night we were in Melbourne and the night before we were in Jacksonville. We're trying to get, you know, we do, usually do a lot of programs in the state of Florida and we, for the first part of this year, we were doing programs only outside the state of Florida. We're now doing programs in 15 states because there are people like you that want to learn and they do come to these programs. So I do thank you all for coming here again tonight. And also I want to thank Santa Fe Genzyme for giving us the funding to do tonight's program and I hope that you all appreciate it as well. So, next Saturday, November 12th, we're doing our annual symposium in South Florida. And at this program, we have three neurologists speaking. Also, we have a disability attorney to speak about social security disability. And we have a person that's coming in from Ohio, a trained physical therapist that is a neurophysical therapist who's gonna speak, especially for women, pelvic floor exercise and how that could benefit you and any urology problems that you might have. We will have a link up for this program starting Monday or Tuesday, and we will make sure to get this link to you. The program starts a little bit after 10 o'clock in the morning and will last until about three o'clock in the afternoon. The three neurologists all have different topics to speak about, and then they will be doing a Q&A for all three at the same time. So this is something that they will start off the day and then we'll just progress to the other topics as well. And you really might want to sit down and take the time to watch this program. By the way, tonight we have special honors to give to somebody in the room. And I'm only doing it now because I'm going to forget later on, so I want to make sure I get it in now. We have a birthday girl in the house. Her name is Evelyn. And everybody should say happy birthday to Evelyn. Happy birthday, Evelyn. Now she's shy and mad at me. <laughs> All right, our first speaker tonight, we're going to have Dr. Brian Steingo. By the way, the two presenters, Dr. Brian Steingo and Patricia Pagnata, are going to give their presentations, and then we will do a Q&A. So please, there might be pads of paper on the table. If not, use whatever paper you can find, or the person sitting next to you, use the back of their hand, okay? And you all got pens. Please just keep note of what you may want to ask in questions later on, and save that for our Q&A. Thank you. Come on up. Thank you, Stuart, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, the, the program that the, the, and, and the subject I'm going to talk about tonight is what Stuart selected. And so we value your input to tell us what, what is important for you to hear. So um, some of the topics that I'm going to talk about tonight include the MS treatment options and the medications. And I'm trying to give you an overview of when you get MS, how you deal with MS, how you pick your medication. It's a very important topic of how you pick your medication. So I have this land of MS idea that I have uh, used in my programs for a long time. And basically, okay. So basically the land of MS uh, is really meant to say that when you have MS, there's many different aspects of MS that we could talk about. And I said, we're entering the land of MS. So tonight, we're all in the little land of MS. And we could pick any topic. When you go see a neurologist on a particular occasion, or you're thinking about MS, we could spend an evening or an afternoon talking about any of these topics. How do we diagnose MS? How do you treat MS? How do you treat the relapse? How do you treat the disease? And then in this land, we have the symptom tower. And it's a tower because there are so many symptoms of MS that you need a big, tall, 25 foot, 25 story skyscraper to treat MS. And then research, talking about research, or social support, and most importantly, self-help, the things you do for yourself. So each one of these could be a topic that we could discuss uh, on, a, on a particular occasion. But tonight, uh, I'm gonna start out telling you a little bit about the history of MS. So you go to many programs and often hear the same kind of things, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about the history of MS. Because the history of MS is that in 1868, MS was really first described. If you think about it, that's almost 150 years ago. Now, if you think that our first approved medication for MS was how long ago? 1993. So from 1868 to 1993, we had no real FDA-approved drug for MS. All those years of MS, there was nothing. Now in 1993, we had our first drug. And as you'll see in a little, in a little while, we now have 15 different agents 
There are proof for MS and there are more that are coming. And the first case of MS in the US was actually described in 1878. And then studies were done that showed us what MS is. That some facts were already known over 100 years ago that MS is more common in women. And that there are many symptoms. That's why it's hard to diagnose MS. So MS is not always easy to diagnose because there's no absolute diagnostic test. There's no blood test that you can do. So it's not always easy to diagnose because there are many symptoms of MS. But in, in, the, early year, in the early part of last century, we knew that it was a, a disease that affected many symptoms, but we didn't know that it was a disease of the immune system. In 1916, now 100 years ago, is when they first found out that MS is a disease that affects myelin. And a lot of the damage is around blood vessels. Early on, they thought MS was due to a poison or a bacteria or a toxin. We didn't recognize that it could be an autoimmune disease. So in the 1930s, an experimental model of MS was discovered in mice. It was called EAE, or Experimental Allergic Encephalomyelitis. So forget that word from now. You can just think of it as EAE. Why do I mention this? Because we still use that model even now, 100 years, not 100 years, 80 years after that time, we still use that same model. It still helps us in an experimental way in an experimental animal to have an animal model of MS, it's still very important. And then there were later studies that showed us that MS is actually an autoimmune disease. And finally, clini clinical trials started with Copaxone and beta serum in the 1970s. This was an important event. In 1946, Sylvia Lowry founded the National MS Society. It was a huge step forward in MS because she brought the importance of MS to the forefront. Before that, it was an ignored, neglected, people didn't understand it kind of disease. And she was huge in, in bringing forward the importance of MS and raising funds for MS and raising money for clinical trials. And the National MS Society still is very active in raising funds for clinical trials and assisting people. But I wanted to highlight Sylvia Lowry. And then seeing that Stuart is here tonight, I thought I would just put that in at the bottom for Stuart. That was to make Stuart happy. Um, but maybe, maybe in years to come, he does a lot of educational programs that will be recognized as something very important to help educate everyone. What about MRI scans? MRI scans were a huge advance in MS. In the, 19, in the early 1980s, MRI scans came about. And before that, it was very hard to diagnose MS. Many people were misdiagnosed. They were called nuts. It's psychological. Go and see the psychiatrist. Man, that was a common thing. You're lazy. That was common. You're lazy and you, you go and see a psychiatrist. But in the early 1980s, MRI scans came about. And the first MRI scan in someone with MS was done in, in Britain in 1981. So think about that. Since that time, MRI scans have been hugely important for us in MS. Firstly, the MRI scan allows us to diagnose MS much more easily. A CAT scan is a waste of time pretty much for MS. So the MRI scan allows us to diagnose MS and to see the lesions that are on the brain and the spinal cord. So we knew they were there. It helps us make a diagnosis. And then we could follow someone. How were they doing? We could get sequential MRI scans and see how you're doing over time. And then the MRI scan is very important in clinical trials to evaluate how a drug is working, what's the effects on the MRI scan. So MRI scans that have been over, around for over 30 years now have been a huge advance. Here's a little definition of what MS is. Now we consider it to be an autoimmune disease, which means it's a disease where the actual primary, the main problem in MS is the immune system. So the immune system malfunctions and attacks the central nervous system. The target, and you'll see that in another slide that I have, the target is the central nervous system and the disease is a diseased immune system. There are many autoimmune diseases. For example, rheumatoid arthritis. The target there is the joints. So there are many autoimmune diseases. But in MS, the target is the central nervous system, which is the brain, the spinal cord, and the optic nerves. The commonest kind of MS by far is relapsing type of MS, which about 80 to 90% of people start out with relapsing MS. And that's a disease in which if we looked at their brains, there is a lot of inflammation. And then there is also about 10% of people who start out with a progressive type of MS, where early on the changes in the brain are more of a degenerative nature. But we know from very, very early on, if we look at brain scans and we look at people, unfortunately they have been able to look at brains of people who had very early MS and had something else happen to them, like an automobile accident, and so they could study brain tissue of people with very early MS and we already can find evidence in very early MS that there's some degenerative changes, which is another reason we want to try and treat this disease as early as possible. So what happens in MS? The first thing is we said the immune system is disordered. So something triggers it off. What triggers off the immune system? We don't know. There are risk factors. We'll talk briefly about some of the risk factors. But there is something that triggers off the immune system. It could be stress. It could be an infection. Something triggers it off and activates the immune system and it activates 
white blood cells, certain type of white blood cells are called lymphocytes that many of you have probably heard of. So the trigger triggers off the immune system, activates the lymphocytes and attacks the target, which is the central nervous system. And the first thing we get is inflammation and then we get the loss of myelin. So when there's inflammation around the nerve, the myelin is damaged. That's why we call MS a demyelinating disease all these years. So there's demyelination. If the, if the process continues, you get a loss of the actual nerve fiber, which is called the axon. That is permanent. There is no repair of an axon. If an axon is damaged, then the damage would be permanent. And finally, that leads to brain atrophy. So somewhere along this sequence of events, we need to, we need to interrupt the sequence because we certainly want to prevent this destructive process at the end. This is just showing you, I just put this up to show you what inflammation looks like. So in the corners, if you look in these corners over here, you'll see what brain, normal brain tissue looks like. And here around this blood, this is a blood vessel, and around the blood vessel you have thousands of these blue dots, those are lymphocytes. That's where the inflammation is. So this is what inflammation looks like. A massive number of these activated lymphocytes that are around a blood vessel. This I actually created myself one day. I probably had some, a few green lizards, you know, something like that. So here is what MS is, what we just said. You have a trigger activating the immune system, which is the lymphocyte, and then ultimately attacking the nervous system. But for this activated lymphocyte to attack the nervous system, it has to pass a barrier. It's called the blood-brain barrier. So between the circulation and the brain, there's a barrier. It's called the blood-brain barrier. What's the importance of this? The importance of this is that we can now pick drugs maybe to work in different locations. So it gives us an opportunity. Maybe we have a drug that works and maybe modifies the triggers. Or maybe the drug modifies the immune system, the lymphocytes. Or maybe the drug shuts down the blood-brain barrier. Or maybe it's going to work directly in the central nervous system. So different, let me populate this. Everybody see that? Or was that too fast? I'll give you another one. So watch this carefully. Watch, watch what happens over here with the trigger. So the trigger is, a <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the trigger is activated. Okay, <laughs> that's my representation of it. So the trigger is activated, the arrow fired, it went right through the blood-brain barrier and attacked the central nervous system. But what you see over here on the left-hand side is some potential triggers. Genetic factors. Oh, we know there's genetic factors in MS. You don't inherit MS directly. You inherit susceptibility to MS. In the population, just to give you an easy number to remember, the incidence of MS in the general population is about 0.1%, which is one in a thousand. And in people with their families of MS, it's about 3%. Different numbers, slightly from different studies, but about 30 times higher. So if someone in your family has MS, you have a higher risk of getting MS, you would inherit susceptibility to it. Environmental factors we know are important. So where you live, we know that MS is much more common in people who live in northern attitudes, latitudes and much less common in people that live closer to the equator. In infections probably are a trigger. The one infection we definitely seems to be a trigger is mono. Uh, that's one factor. But there's probably other infections that are triggers too. These are triggers in a person who's susceptible. And finally, another one that's in here in this list is vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency appears to be very important. And so they've published many studies now on vitamin D. There is a Scandinavian a study that was done taking uh, data from Scandinavia. So Scandinavia has national health. So you can look at everybody's lab work from the time they were born. So they took a bunch of people with MS and looked then at their mothers and looked at their mother's vitamin D levels during pregnancy and they were low. So if a woman even has low vitamin D during pregnancy, that could mean that her, her child could have a higher risk of MS. And we know that in adolescents and adults, young, female, young, young patients, especially young females, with low vitamin D could be a risk factor. And one other one that I need to add to my list here, another risk, potential risk factor is obesity especially in young adults or adolescent and especially in females could be another risk factor so you could have the perfect storm of a person that has ms and then their child a, who's a young adult or adolescent uh, is obese and not taking vitamin d and these are important could be uh, leading could set up for ms so the lymphocytes part of the immune system t cells and b cells different types of treatments work on these cells some will work on t cells and b cells some work just on t cells some work just on b cells uh, some medications work at the blood-brain barrier, and finally some work in the brain itself. So that's the importance of knowing about this, is because it gives us an opportunity to have different drugs that work in different locations. That shows you just how the blood-brain barrier could be closed down. Medications, interferons will close down the blood-brain barrier, and Tysabri will close down the blood-brain barrier and keep these activated lymphocytes out of the central nervous system. So here are some risk factors. We spoke about these. 
geographic factors, people that live in northern latitudes, uh, genetic susceptibility, I told you about that one, vitamin D, microorganisms, bacteria, microorganisms are becoming more and more important in MS uh, in the microbiome. So in the gastrointestinal tract, which is not a topic that we necessarily will cover unless you ask the question, but in the gastrointestinal tract, we know that we have trillions. So a huge part of our immune system is our gastrointestinal tract, our small intestines. Our intestines are a huge part of our immune system, and there are bacteria living there. And they're quite happy because we feed them, and they do some stuff to help us as well. And if we have the wrong bacteria, it could trigger off our immune system. So there are bacteria in our gastrointestinal tract. We call that the microbiome. You're going to need more and more about that, and it's going to bring us more and more to maybe doing some dietary things that could be important for our health. I told you about obesity. Oh, there's the microbiome. And smoking appears to be a risk factor as well. What happens if you don't take treatment for your MS? So we know the answer to this in part, because if you go back, we only had our first drug in 1993. So we have many studies that were performed before 1993, and we could follow patients and say, what happens if you don't have treatment? And so we know that there are some people who are very fortunate, they have what we call benign MS. Their attacks are infrequent, and they have very little disability. It's hard to predict that at the beginning, but these are people that have gone 10 years or so, and we say, you have had a benign course of your MS. Now, MS, we always have to be vigilant, because they've done studies on people with benign MS, and if you look at them 10 years later, some of them have gone on and had further disease. So, but benign MS is about 10 to 20% of people. And then about 5% of people have what we call malignant MS which is a rapid accumulation of disability, rapidly maybe wheelchair bound or in a bed within even five years. So that's the two extreme ends of it. Most people are in the middle range. And we know that without treatment, 15 years after the diagnosis, 50% of people have progressed. So it's another reason why we want to start treatment early. Because without treatment, 15 years after the diagnosis, 15% of people have progressed. And 25 years after the diagnosis, 80% of people have progressed. So the natural course of this disease is to be a progressive disease. So here, I don't know how that's showing up for all of you, but this is prognostic factors. Can we evaluate your situation and have an idea of how you're going to do? And there it says we can't get some idea. The first thing that we look at is your age. Older age of onset tends to have a worse prognosis, maybe a more progressive type of MS often in older patients like over the age of 50 with MS. Second thing that's important is the symptoms at onset. There are certain symptoms that are more worrisome than others. For example, if there are symptoms involving the spinal cord or the brain stem, those would be very worrisome symptoms. Those would be symptoms that would cause problems with walking very early on, problems with the bowel and the bladder very early on, problems with lo loss of balance early on would be worrisome symptoms. The third thing is the MRI status. I'm going to show you this in another slide in a minute. How your MRI looks at the beginning is important as well. How long you have between your first and your second attack. How many attacks you have in the first two years and how much you recover. So these are all things we're going to look at. So if you're relatively newly diagnosed or you're on a medication and you say, how am I looking? These are questions. You can look at these. So this all, as you know, Stuart is, going to, is recording this. It's going to be on YouTube. So this is just for your reference over here for now. But then you can go and study it. And when you go and see your, when you go and see your uh, healthcare practitioner, these are things you're going to say. Well, what's my prognosis like? How many attacks have I had? I've had many attacks in the first couple of years, or they were close together. So these are all questions you could look at, and by virtue of these items, you can add up uh, a, risk, a risk profile, which I'll put on this graph on the right-hand side. But the more of these you have, the higher the risk is. And the higher the risk, the more aggressive you might want to be with your treatment. It's actually important to know about these risk factors. This shows you about the brain scan. Is the brain scan important? And the answer is the brain scan does give us some information. And the first thing about the first thing is that if someone is newly diagnosed with a symptom, let's take a symptom such as optic neuritis. Someone has optic neuritis and we look at their brain scan and they have no lesions on their brain scan. There's no white spots in their brain scan. Even so, they have about a 20% risk, about a 20% risk of developing MS over the next 10 to 20 years. So no lesions, 10 to 20% risk. Now let's say they have one to three lesions. What's their risk of developing MS? about 80%. How about if they have 10 lesions, what's their risk? Still 80%. So the important fact over here is that if you have no lesions, the risk is low. If you have lesions, even one MS appearing lesion, and it is a lesion, we like to see a lesion that has characteristics of MS, even one lesion, the risk of developing MS is very similar. So what's the difference between the number of lesions? That's on the right-hand side over here. The more lesions that someone has, 
the more disabled that they would be at the end of 10 to 20 years. So the person that has one lesion would be less disabled at the end of 10 to 20 years than the person that has 10 lesions right at the beginning. So if you look at your scan early on, there's already 10 lesions. Uh, we, can, we can predict that at 10 to 20 years that you're going to be more disabled, that you'll reach an EDSS of six. And the EDSS of six, that's our disability scale we use. It's called an EDSS scale. And that scale indicates that a six is somebody walking with a cane. So if somebody has 10 lesions when we first diagnose them, their chance of having walking with a cane in 10 to 20 years is significant. And if you think that the average person with MS starts out at between 20 to 40, and we're talking only 10 to 20 years later that you have a high chance of having to use a cane or a walker, and that these are significant numbers. This is just showing you the definitions of MS. What kinds of MS are there? We said the commonest type of, at onset is called relapsing MS. We have on the le very left-hand side, I put in there called CIS, clinically isolated syndrome. That would be your very first symptom. And at that time, we might not actually be able to absolutely say you have MS. But we might say you have your first symptom, and we can't absolutely diagnose MS today, but you have a very high risk for developing MS. And our treatment for that is essentially the same as the way we treat relapsing MS. And then on the right-hand side, you see we bunch together there progressive types of MS. Now, if somebody has relapsing MS to start with, they have a chance over the years of developing secondary progressive MS. So secondary because they started out relapsing. Some people start out right from the beginning with progressive MS. We call that primary progressive. But we're changing our concepts a little bit. And I think in the future, you're going to, say, you're going to see us say that there are two kinds of MS. There is the relapsing type of MS, which is CIS, and what we used to call relapsing remitting. And there is the progressive type, either secondary progressive or primary progressive. So our definitions of MS are probably going to change over time. It's either relapsing or it's progressive. Now, this slide, to me, is hard for you probably all to see. I said they're archived. You're going to see it. But it's an outstanding slide. Because this slide, if I was showing you this slide in 1990, if I was showing you this in April 1993, this would be a blank slide. It would just be blue. You'd have a blue background. It would say approved MS therapies, and there'd be a big zero on there. So this is fantastic. And this shows you 15 FDA approved agents for MS. They're not different drugs because there's several forms. There's three forms of copaxone. There's several forms of interferons. So there are 15 agents that we now have available for MS. And there's probably at least one more we're going to have within the next few months. So that's a lot. This is a busy slide. This makes it very interesting for us to treat you. How do we treat you? There's injectables. There's oral medications. There's infusions. And so you, can never, you should never ask the question, what should I pick? Or say to your physician, what would you choose? Because I just put this in here to show you that of all the drugs we have, the reason why I put this in is because they work in many different ways. Some of them work on, on the lymphocytes and the immune system. Some work at the blood-brain barrier. Some may have effect directly in the central nervous system. So let me bypass this. I just put up again to remind us that drugs work in many ways. So this is the important question. You've been diagnosed with MS, and now you want to know what to do. And so you can look at this slide. These are the questions that you should have with you when you speak to your neurologist. This is just your little questions, handbook of questions. So this is what you say. Which medicine should I take? How do we decide what to use? When should I start the medication? Maybe you've seen different doctors who told you different things. Maybe you don't like needles. Uh, where can you find literature? What can you read? This kind of program, news, educational programs. What are the side effects? How safe is the therapy? Can I have kids? I'm concerned about the cost of the therapy. So all of these are very important, relevant questions. So you don't have to write them down tonight. Uh, these are questions that maybe if, you, if someone says they have MS, you tell them to go and look at this on YouTube and write down these questions. Ask your doctor these questions. And here's another way of all the things we have to think about. So many times in the office, a patient has said to me, what would you pick? If you had MS, and I'm saying, I, I, I can't tell you what to pick. I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to be your coach. And so in this land of MS, I'm your coach. I'm going to give you the plays. I'm going to tell you all the things that we could do. But at the end of the day, the final decision must be what's comfortable for you. And it could be based on many things that you see over here. So firstly, most obvious things about any medication is we want to know about safety, efficacy, tolerability. How safe is the drug? How effective is the drug? How is it tolerated? And everybody has different has different t tolerability. Somebody might say, I want the drug that's the strongest drug. I'm less concerned about safety. Or somebody could say, I want the safest drug that's been out there the longest. So we pick this. Might be depending on what you like, patient preference. Or let's see what the evidence shows. Or what's the healthcare provider's experience. 
Are they very experienced? Do they know about all the drugs? Or they just know about one or two drugs? How does the drug work? Mechanism of action. A female of childbearing age. What's the cost? This one I should put in red, flashing red. Because insurance companies now give us all day long, we're getting pushback and fighting all day long. We're fighting them. And convenience, you might say, I like something that I only take once a month or once a year and not every day. Monitoring and screening, what's required? Do I have to do blood tests regularly? Do I have to go and do heart tests or eye tests or what do I have to do? So all these are important questions that you have. Now these are questions when you start your medication. So right at the beginning when you're newly diagnosed and you're starting out with your MS, on your MS journey in the land of MS, these are all things you need. But let's say you're on a medication, you've been on it for two years, now you're having relapses. Your condition is not stable. How do you pick a new drug? Well, guess what? You bring this whole thing up again. This is everything you want to know about. The, the situation is exactly the same with the new drug. You want to know about safety. You want to know about efficacy. You want to know about tolerability. You want to know about all those things again. Now, put this up again. I don't expect you to look at this long list over here. But when we're trying to pick the appropriate drug for you, these are all things we have to look at. How severe is your MS? Is it very aggressive or is it mild? What other conditions do you have that might change our decision as to what to treat you with? What's your family history? Risk tolerance, childbearing potential. We look at JC virus. What's your immune system like? So these, these are all the things we have to look at. And this could be some other conditions. It's a long list of all these conditions that we need to know about. So when you go and see your physician, your nurse practitioner, when you go to the office and you are going to be treated, every time you go, that's important that you give us all your information. I'm going to show you that briefly at the end, how important this is over here, that we know about all these other conditions that you have and the tests that we might have to do to follow your condition, like liver tests, or blood tests, or thyroid tests, or heart tests, or lung tests, or your blood pressure, your eyes, many things that we might have to follow. Now here's some of the side effects that we, can, that, we have to, that we have to go through and deal with. Again, I'm just showing you the list so you can be impressed that there's a list. I don't want you to sit and study this list. In fact, please don't look at it now. If you need to look at it, you can look at it later. But this is to show you what the list of all the things we have to consider when we're talking about these drugs. Flu-like symptoms, depression, liver problems, lipoatrophy, PML, malignancy, there's a lot of different issues, each of these different with different drugs, but these are all considerations we might have because we have 15 different medications out there. But at the end of the day, this is the goals of our MS therapy. Number one, we said early on in MS there's inflammation. We want to reduce the inflammation. We want to slow down or stop the relapses. We want to improve your MRI outcomes. We want to slow down the progression of disability, so at the end, you remember that whole sequence, we want to reduce brain atrophy. Because what happens is that you could also have other symptoms of MS, like the invisible symptoms of MS. Never forget the invisible symptoms. Cognitive dysfunction, fatigue, those are invisible. People can't see you with those symptoms, but they're most important and most disabling. So we want to slow all these down, and at the end of the day, improve the quality of your life. Ultimately, with new trials for drugs, we would like to have a drug, this may look complex, but you'd like to have a drug in a trial in the future that has no disease activity. So when you look at the drug, we're going to say, this particular drug, there were no relapses. There was no progression of disability. And the MRI scans, the white spots and the active spots, the what do you call enhancing spots, when we gave you the contrast, the gadolinium, it was free of those. So this would potentially be in the future a way of looking at a new drug, is to say, in how many people was there no, no disease activity? No relapses, no disability, MRI scans didn't progress. Ultimately, in the future, I put this out there, you're going to hear more about this. Drugs that may be potentially in a trial, will, they will measure how, much, how, much of these, how many of these patients had no evidence of disease activity. So that's a summary of kind of like how you approach your medications and what we already have. What are our needs in the future? One of the most important needs is to identify biomarkers. How do we pick the drug for you? Wouldn't it be nice if I could say, we're taking your blood, we're looking at it, we're looking maybe at the genes in your blood, and we can predict from that which medication you're going to respond to or what kind of MS you're going to have. So we in the future may want biomarkers to tell us, is this more likely to be a progressive MS, a relapsing MS, an aggressive MS? Those are future things we want to develop, biomarkers. And then we want new drugs. Maybe what's the perfect world? Is a drug that's very effective and that's much safer. So we want new drugs. What about stem cells, development of stem cells? And how about learning more and more about the dietary aspects of MS, becoming more and more knowledgeable about that? And then managing the symptoms, having better medications to manage symptoms. So these are all some future needs and directions. I'm just putting up here what a clinical trial is. And a clinical trial is the way that every single drug for MS is approved. 
And in my mind, anybody that signs up for a clinical trial is an MS hero, because without those people, we wouldn't have any drugs at all. Uh, some of the older trials and still some new trials have a new drug that's measured and compared to a placebo. But a lot of the new studies, the drug will be compared to an active drug that's out there, because sometimes ethically we feel we can't give someone a placebo, depending on what kind of MS they have. But there are several types of clinical trials. The big clinical trial is called the phase three trial. After that is when the drug's approved. Now look at point two over here. Many new trials started for MS. And so if you look, if you go to the clinicaltrials.gov, which, which is a site I recommend for all of you to know, clinicaltrials.gov, and you look that up and you say, how many trials are there for MS? And look at this number, this outstanding number. Since 2000, 900 trials for MS and more than 300 ongoing or planned studies. So there's a huge amount of research that's going on for MS. A list for you over here, some of the compounds and trials. Now I put ocreluzumab up here because it's kind of in between. It's a medication that's completed its trial and was shown to be effective, but it's not yet approved, and it is one that's gonna hopefully be approved in the next few months. And I mention it because not only was this very effective in relapsing MS, but it's the first medication that worked for relapsing MS that's also been shown to have benefit for progressive MS. So we're hoping that the FDA will also approve this drug for treatment of MS. In the trial, it was tried for primary progressive MS. We don't know where the FDA will go with this. We're hoping it may get approved for treating progressive forms of MS. Here's a list of compounds in clinical trials. Now, if you look at the top, the top seven, you'll see some names there that are common medications used for other things. For example, statins. There's some evidence that statins may help in some types of MS. There was some benefit in some patients with progressive MS, but in a very high dose. Minocycline recently result information published on that. That's been around for a few years. It's an antibiotic. It's a common antibiotic. And using minocycline also had great benefit in MS, and it's considerably cheaper than anything we have. So we need more information on that. So some common compounds that are already out there might become very important in the future for MS. And then a whole bunch of other research drugs. Cladribine uh, has, has gone in Europe. They're currently re-evaluating and might improve cladribine for MS, so it could be another drug we might have in the future. But most importantly on the bottom, I want to show you these two, vitamin D and biotin. And we have known about the effect and the importance of vitamin D for a while. There are still some negative people out there that say, well, the effects are not that well established. But in my mind, vi 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 vitamin D is very important for MS. Uh, one question nobody has to ask me is how much should you take? Because I can't tell you until I have your blood level. That's straightforward. You get a blood test done, it tells you what your vitamin D level is, then we can tell you how much to take. And we know vitamin D is very important. I told you about the studies even in pregnant women and the risk of their children for having uh, MS. So vitamin D is very important. And now there's some recent work with biotin. So high dose biotin. So we're not talking about biotin that you find in a multivitamin, that is a low dose. So in Europe they have studied high dose biotin. I'll tell you the dose, it's 100 milligrams three times a day. And it's thousands of times more than you usually find in a typical multivitamin. And it was beneficial in people, in some aspects, in some parts of the study, for people with progressive MS that they actually saw some benefits from it. So there's a study going on in the US for this. If you're not eligible or you're not in one of those areas, you could have your physician prescribe biotin in a high dose from a compounding pharmacist, and it was pretty well approved. So this is something you could do right now for progressive MS. And the other thing that they've recently written about, that I didn't put on my list, is lipoic acid. A recent study showed in the US, a good study, that lipoic acid may have some benefit for progressive MS. So here now we're starting to talk, you can hear me talk about progressive MS. Isn't that nice be for us to be able to say some positive things about progressive MS? Biotin, lipoic acid, the new medication coming along. We have some positive ideas about ocreluzumab stem cells. I'm going to talk about briefly. So hemopoietic stem cell therapy is the most common type. And that's what that basically is doing is restoring your immune system. So we said your immune system in MS is what's damaged. And so with these stem cells, what we do is we take, they take the stem cells from your body, they prepare them, they freeze them. And then they essentially destroy your own bone marrow with chemotherapy. And then they take your immune cells and inject them back into you. And we're hoping now that your immune system is restored, reset, rebooted, that you have a new immune system that will be much better. So that is the commonest type of stem cell that's out there. Now, the other two that I put at the bottom are future types of stem cells. Because what we want in the future is stem cells that will actually regrow myelin and regrow the damaged cells. We don't have that. So we don't have the stem cells that are actually going to regrow uh, your, your nervous system. We have the stem cells that are going to reboot your immune system. And I've had several patients in recent weeks who've told me they're going to their orthopedic surgeon and getting stem cells into their knees. And the orthopedic surgeon told them, well, that'll be great for your MS. It'll help your MS heal up too. And I said, that's like, it's witchcraft. 
That's not true. That's not going to happen. So let's just show you some places. In the US, most of the stem cell work has been done by Richard Burt uh, in Northwestern Chicago with some very good results. Uh, and the results have been that, that people that had stem cell therapy post-transplant showed improvement. And a large number of them had no further relapses. And some recent studies published from Ottawa, uh, Mark Friedman and Atkins published some studies from Ottawa, and also in the US, James Bowen at Swedish Medical Center, and the top one is Sheffield Teaching Hospitals in uh, England, where they've done a lot of stem cell work too. So this is some of the places that, you, that have been doing that. Now, so mostly what I wanted to talk to you about, pretty much I'm almost done now, is the treatments and how you try all the aspects, all the things we have to think about when we start treating you for MS. But we don't only give you drugs for your MS. We have to give you drugs for your MS symptoms as well. And so there's a long list of these. I'm not going to go into these, um, but you can see this long list. What's the importance of this long list of all these medications that you can look at? Look at all these different symptoms that we have to treat. And if we're not careful, very soon we're going to have you on a bunch of drugs. And what's the result of all these drugs together? Polypharmacy. We're giving you drugs for MS. We're giving you drugs for MS symptoms. We're giving you drugs for other diseases, diabetes, hypertension, other conditions, thyroid disease. And so what happens? There are all kinds of interactions that could happen. So we need to be very aware about that. So therefore, it's very important that you give us a list of all your medications. And so therefore, what is the patient adherence to MS medications? It's not great. People with MS often do not take their drugs as prescribed. This was particularly seen with injectables. But guess what? With the oral medications, it's not very much better. People don't adhere. Why don't they? So it could be needle phobia. They don't like taking needles. It could be because of the side effects. So you need to have good communication. Good communication helps with that. Perceived lack of efficacy. It's very important for us to discuss with you your expectations and not for someone to say, I stopped my medication because it's not working. So I've had that many times. I've seen someone six months ago and they return and they stopped their medication even in six months or nine months or whatever it is. And it was like, why do you stop? Because it's not working. I say, that's great. You have an MRI scan in your garage. How do you know it's not working? Because I'm not better. So these medications are meant to stop the disease from progressing. Stop it in its tracks. And then we may do other things to make you better, like exercise and diet and other things like that. And then depression. People that are depressed have a higher risk of not taking their medications. And then finally, uh, the importance of establishing realistic expectations. So how do we enhance your adherence? Important that you have a good relationship with your healthcare practitioner and all the people involved in your care. Your expectations, managing your expectations, explaining what the medications that you're taking are supposed to do. Education, managing the side effects. All of those things help us help you stay on the medication because if you don't stay on it, you're not going to get the benefits. And so this is all the things that I uh, am always advocating for people to do for themselves. And so you see this acronym over there. It's teams of friends. So you need teams of friends. If you have teams of friends, then you manage your disease much better. It's very important that you are actively involved. It shouldn't only be what I'm doing. You have to be part of this. As I said right at the beginning, you're the quarterback. You're Dan Marino. I'm Don Shula, maybe. I'm the quarterback. You're, you're no, it's not going to work. I, I can't execute. I can't make the play. I can just tell you what to do. And these are all the things that I can talk to you about that you need to do. Your expectations, adherence, mental activity, sleep, outlook, fatigue, food, relationships, interactions, exercise, news, vitamin D, all these things are very important things. And so finally, I'm going to end on this one over here, which is my, which I call, uh, which is our communication tool, uh, which I have in our office, and, and this is on the internet. I'm showing you in a neurologist's office, they have something similar to this. Uh, and what this is, is the form that all, I ask all my patients to fill in at home. And it gives me all the information, and I, you probably can't see much of this from where you are. Uh, you know, Stuart, did you, did you give these out tonight? No. No, okay. But they're on the internet there, so hopefully your neurologist will ask you similar questions. And so this says all the things I need to know when you come to my office. It says, just say, the basic information, is there a change in your insurance, all that kind of nonsense, we get that out of the way. Then it says, what are your questions today? So you could come in and say, I'm here for a checkup. I'm here because my bladder's troubling me. Write that down right up front. So when I look at this immediately, I know what, what our highlight of our visit's gonna be. Underneath that, it asks you for all your neurological symptoms. Update me. Tell me about numbness or weakness or how you're walking or how your balance is or how your fatigue is or how your bowel and your bladder are. Tell us all these things. And then we want a list of your medications. And then on page two, 
On top there, it asks you very important social issues. How are you doing? Are you working? Are you smoking? Are you drinking alcohol? Are you exercising? What is the quality of your life? Do you have a lot of stress? Because sometimes that's all we have to do. Today I spent half an hour with the person who was crying the whole visit because unfortunately her life is, is such poor quality. And we're trying to help her get it to the social workers, do whatever we can for her. That was our whole visit. RMS per se is not bad, that was our whole visit. And then at the bottom of that, all, in all these blocks over here is your other conditions. It asks you about other, other parts of your body. How your, how's your heart and your lungs? And, and then we include the bowel and the bladder in that section only because of space, but it asks you a bunch of questions. So it's very important that you fill this in when you bring it every time. Spend some time, because if you bring this in, it's valuable. When, you're, when, when your healthcare practitioner looks at this, we can immediately plan our visit. So at the bottom here, it asks you for your medications, and you've probably heard me say this before. Medications, bring your list, bring it with you, copy it. What's the worst kind of medication that you can be taking? The same. So people write that at the bottom there, the same. The same doesn't help me. Because now if you say the same, I have to say, well, let's think about this. Let's look at what you're taking. Are you still taking this? It's wasting time. If you write your medications down, I can immediately see what they are. We know about potential interactions. Don't write down the same or unchanged. Have you ever been to Walgreens for unchanged? Yeah, go to Walgreens, say, go to the drive-thru and say, could I have unchanged? And I say, well, they don't have unchanged. Can I have the same as last time? We're on file. By the time you're asking for that, they're calling 911 to get you arrested because they're thinking, you know. So please write down all your medication. The more information you give us, there can never be too much information. There can only be too little information. Take information with you. If you had an MRI, bring the CD. If you have medications, write them down. If you have new lab work and we don't have it, bring it with you. The more you bring, the better the visit's going to be so we can spend time talking about the problems and not waste time trying to extract. We don't want to be dentists. I'm not trying to extract stuff from you. I want you to bring it to me. Then we can spend valuable time talking about the problems. So makes the makes the visit much much more valuable, helps you take your medications, helps you with understanding. It just uh, improves the whole the whole nature of the visit when you do that. Because the worst kind of thing that happens is the door question. Maybe all of you have had a door question, which is after you've spent 37 and a half minutes with someone and they're just at the door, they're about to leave, and they ask the question, "Oh, I forgot to ask you about this." And of course, that's never a straightforward question that they forgot. It's like my bladder's not doing well. Well, that's just like 30 second question, right? Your bladder. No, it isn't. So write everything down, please. It helps us help you. So, um, yeah, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Nice, 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 nice. Thank you. Steps to the other one. Save a broken leg. Um, for those before or as Patricia Pagnot is coming up here, this tool that Dr. Steinger was talking about is found on our website. You could go to the website, you could print it from there, so that way you could have it for yourselves, or you could actually type in your information, then print out whatever it is that you could type in on it. Well, first save it, then click print, and everything will print out, all right? But then anything else that's on there that needs to be circled, you'll just have to circle it off. No more about that. As you all know, Patricia Pagnata. All right, thank you all so much for coming out. Um, and Dr. Steingo, I'm pleased to always be with Dr. Steingo. He's such a great speaker. Um, so I hope that you all enjoyed that. I appreciate those of you that have come out, and I know that you know Stuart does these programs and he tapes them, so many of them are on YouTube. He asks that persons that are here fill out an evaluation because Stuart runs these programs to be able to educate individuals. And so if you're here, please make sure that you fill out that evaluation and write specifically what you would like to have healthcare providers talk to you about, or if you'd like somebody else, please write down specifics. Because as you're gonna see, when you got the flyer for this, there was very general things that Dr. Steingo and I were going to speak about. And so I think Dr. Steingo and I um, are tripping over one another in some aspects. Um, so just to let you know that. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can email MS Views and News and tell them what you would like to have at another program. So please do that because we're really here to be able to educate you. Um, so my topic tonight I talked about um, is going to be making strides in wellness with multiple sclerosis. 
So I want to talk to you about the comprehensive steps to living well with multiple sclerosis. And I've identified seven different things that are extremely important for living well with multiple sclerosis. Um, and I put them up here in a, a ranking order, but that does not mean that these number one is the first thing or, or whatnot. Um, although I would say um, in this particular situation, a disease modifying medication, I probably would put at number one. <clears throat> Symptom management is number two, as far as this list. Tobacco and alcohol use, dietary, diet, supplements, weight management, physical activity, personal and social well-being, and then prevention and management of other conditions. So those are the steps for living well with multiple sclerosis. One of the things that I like to remind persons that treating MS successfully requires a village. Those of us who specialize in MS understand that whatever our specialty is, we depend on several other persons to be able to provide excellent care to persons that have MS. So me as a nurse practitioner, I can prescribe medications like the neurologist I work with, but and I can tell you about the importance of exercise and whatnot, but I'm not as good as a physical therapist or an occupational therapist, and I would never do that. Um, and there are urologists. Yes, I know about bladder issues, but there's a urologist that we might need to involve, and speech therapists. Um, physician's assistants work in a similar role as myself, social workers. So the key is being open to the fact that when you come to see to have your MS cared for, it's not just seeing one person. You are going to see one person and you might be sent out to see other people. And that's extremely important for us to be able to manage your disease well. Um, one of the things that you might not see up here, um, but it is up here, and I require persons who come to my office, a primary care doctor. Because despite I may be giving you something, or I may have something that I can treat, there are some things that you don't want me treating anymore. I've been in neurology now for so many years. There are certain disease states that, yeah, you may see me more frequently than your primary care doctor, but I don't want to be treating, cer treating certain things. And so a primary care doctor is extremely important in your care. So that's something that you should have and you should keep a relationship with your primary care doctor. As Dr. Steingo said, it's extremely important that you update us with information. So if you're a therapist of any change, we should know that. If you change your primary care doctor, please make sure that you tell us that. Because our note's going to go to the last primary care doctor that we have on file. And if you haven't seen that person in three years, that's not going to do any good. Um, so keep us up to date with those things. So now let's move on to the seven steps, disease-modifying therapy. So as Dr. Seingo said, there are many options. There are 15, there's soon to be 16. The issue is there is the risk of MS. The risk of MS is permanent disability and decreased quality of life. So persons talk to me about, well, I don't know that I want to take a disease-modifying therapy. There are so many risks to a disease-modifying therapy. Well, there is real, real risk to this disease of MS. So you need to partner with your healthcare provider and look at your report card. What is your report card? Are you having relapses, MRI activity, disability, and are you able to adhere to a medication? What is the tolerability? And so work again, partner with a healthcare provider. Everyone who has a disease that can be treated should be on a disease modifying medication, okay? So symptom management. It's extremely important to manage your symptoms. When I teach persons about MS, other healthcare providers, I tell them you're never going to have a patient come back to you if you don't treat their symptoms. The symptoms of MS are numerous and interrelated. So here is the list of many of the symptoms of MS, fatigue, pain, bowel, bladder problems, impaired mobility, cognitive dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, ataxia, loss of sensation, dizziness, vertigo spasticity, depression, anxiety, pseudo ball effect. You know there's a commercial now for that. 
I was so impressed. I saw that commercial the other day. Um, visual disturbances, in um, coordination, heat intolerance, weakness, swallowing and speech problems, and sleep disturbances. These are all symptoms, and they, again, one can relate to another, and one can potentially cause another, but all of these need to be treated. Two, same slide. So I'm going to talk about just a few symptoms, because if I was to cover all of them, we'd be here till tomorrow. Um, so pain and MS. One of the things that I like to uh, make sure that we do keep talking about is the invisible symptoms, because when persons are having weakness, I very rarely find them not want to talk to me about that. But they will forget to talk to me about some things that are invisible, and pain is one of them. Pain is a very complex sensory phenomena. There are multiple causes of pain. Some can be neuropathic, meaning from the nerve. Some can be musculoskeletal skeletal pain, optic neuritis can cause pain, spasticity causes pain, dystonia, a abnormal flexion of your muscles, all of these things can cause pain. And so there's non-pharmacological ways to treat pain, and I like to incorporate these first and, and continue to remodify these. So when we're looking at things like musculoskeletal pain and even neuropathic pain, your posture and how you sit can impair your pain. So improving your posture and um, your seating. Physical therapy is extremely important in treating pain. Persons who are walking wrong, using different muscles, are causing themselves pain. Persons who are um, potentially not using assistive devices right, so they're using it wrong. I can't tell you how many people I see using a cane using the wrong, using the wrong hand um, or not using an assistive device. Sometimes you don't recognize that if you just put um, used a s small advice um, like an AFO that that would help make things so much better and maybe you might have not so much pain by stubbing your toe. Or maybe if you got something to help you flex your hip, you would do so much better. Um, and physical therapists can help with muscle strengthening and stretching. Stretching exercises are extremely important for managing spasticity. And then there's other things like acupuncture. For some people, acupuncture is very effective at managing pain. Yoga. Yoga is um, toning and stretching, and that can be very helpful in managing certain types of pain. So there's non-pharmacological treatments that require you to be active in doing these things to help yourself out. When we look at pharmacological treatment for pain, there are tons of things that we can give persons. One of the things that I like to tell persons is, oh, I can give you something, but if we haven't tried these other things, know that the things that I'm going to give you all have a list of side effects. Um, not prescribing a medication is best because I'm not going to give you any side effects. So then we have to start looking at these and what are the side effects and maybe possibly are there a couple different symptoms that you have and maybe we could implore one of these drugs that might be able to treat two of your symptoms. In other words, let's say you're having neuropathic pain, burning, aching type of pain or tingling, prickling type of pain and you also have nighttime, frequent nighttime urination. Amitriptyline and nortriptyline might be a good choice for that because that might stop some of that frequent getting up at nighttime, but also help relieve pain. Um, so trazodone is also a, a drug that can treat fibromyalgia and treats nerve pain um, too. These are the class of antidepressants. And typically I tell persons when I'm prescribing antidepressants for pain, most of the time, I'm using a third or less the dose to treat depression. Because when you go to the pharmacy to pick up the prescription, you get from the pharmacy what the drug is for based off of the clinical trial that brought a drug to market. So amitriptyline has been out forever. And there weren't a lot of studies looking at amitriptyline in pain, but there were a lot, it was prescribed initially for depression. So when you get the um, 
paper from the pharmacy, it's going to say, I'm giving you an antidepressant. Well, I typically type, try to warn persons about that before they leave the office because I'll get a call back invariably, even sometimes if I warn them, well, I'm not depressed. Why are you giving me an antidepressant? And I don't want to take an antidepressant because then persons will think I'm depressed. Um, so, you know, again, um, usually much lower dose than for depression, but can be used for pain. The other thing is any epileptic medication, seizure medicines are very good pain relieving type of medications. So gabapentin, Lyrica, um, carbazepine, Topamax, Topiramate is the generic name for that. Depakote, Valpuric Acid is the generic name for that. Lamictal and Lamotrigine is the generic name for that. So those are anti-epileptic medications that have very good pain management properties. They also treat seizures. They also can be used for mood disorders. So again, if we can kill two birds with one stone, that's always a good thing. Um, but if I put you on one of these medications, I'm not necessarily saying that you have seizures. Um, so that's an important thing to know. Um, and again, looking at the side effects. Antispasmodic medications um, are also pain relieving medications, things like baclofen, Xanaflex, and some of the benzodiazepines are very good um, pain medications. So these are the typical things that I start with using in my practice. And it, you know, the bottom line is if I can't control your pain or we need to go to something like narcotic type of pain medicines, or if at some point um, marijuana becomes um, a drug that is prescribed on a regular basis in the state, I can tell you that you're going to get a, manage, a referral to a pain management, at least out of my office, because that requires a whole nother level of monitoring that we don't do in our offices because of state regulations. So you will get a referral to a pain management doctor. So again, that's another person in the village that is important to taking care of you if you have a pain problem that is not well managed with these type of medications and, and non-pharmacological medications. So depression, depression is huge in MS. At some point, they say 50% of persons who have MS will also suffer an occurrence of depression. Most of the time, it's transient. But for some persons, depression can be something that is um, long term. And so again, it's extremely important that we treat this because not treating depression um, is a big uh, factor in altering your quality of life and helping you with um, losing self-esteem. And we know that that then leads to many other problems. So your um, healthcare provider should be screening you for depression on a regular basis. This is essential. When we look at the clinical characteristics, what does depression feel like or how would persons describe depression? It might be feeling sad or feeling empty, irritable, crying, having a loss of energy, fatigue, um, having a loss in interest in doing things, not the fact that you don't do things. I, tell, I have some persons that say, well, yeah, I still want to do all these things, but I can't because of X, Y, and Z. But if you have lost the interest to even try doing things, that can be depression. Significant changes in your appetite, either eating more or eating less, changes in your weight, unusual sleep behaviors. So either not sleeping well, sleeping too much, having irritable dreams, um, having um, visions maybe at nighttime, decreased sexual drive, and suicidal thoughts. And um, you know, some people don't recognize how maybe quiet some of these thoughts can be. You know, I've had persons that I've screened for this that have just talked to me about, they've just thought about what would it be like to be dead? Or what would it be like if as I'm driving down the road and that car came across the double line? Well, most people driving don't think of those type of things. So if you're thinking of things like that, Make sure that you're sharing that with the persons around you. And that's extremely important. 
So treating this, it's we have got to implore comprehensive management. Identify the risk factors for depression, combine counseling with antidepressants. We should not do just one or the other. Focus on wellness, things like eating properly, exercising, living healthy, making regular follow-up appointments. When we prescribe medications for depression, the standard is if we give you a medication to treat depression, you need to be back in our office in a couple weeks to a month at the most. We're not going to send you out there for three or four months. So it may be that we have you come back or again, we implore other persons to help us out because um, if you're seeing us in addition, because you're coming from your local neurologist, then we may need to be referring you out for someone to help with this. So it's extremely important that you are following up. And please be alert to suicidal thoughts or recurring depression and share that with your family. If you are a um, care partner of someone that has MS, please take these type of things seriously. Um, I can't tell you about the number of persons that have died in clinical trials alone just because of depression. So it is real and it does happen. So please um, take that seriously. So now we're gonna move on to another area of wellness and that is um, tobacco and alcohol use. So um, reports say that up to 20% of persons with MS smoke. I find that amazing. Amazing in some days, I think it's much more than 20%. And in some days I think, wow, 20% of people still smoke? Um, but this is just persons with MS. We know that in, um, increases the risk of developing MS by 50%. So if you're a care partner and you don't have MS and you're smoking, your increased risk of developing MS by 50%. Secondhand smoke has the same effect. So if you want to be able to take the break with the persons in the office that so go out and smoke, forget it. Don't do it because... If you're not inhaling it into your lungs by bringing the cigarette up to your mouth, breathing it in your environment in a closed space has the same risk. So please um, think about that. We know that tobacco does lead to other medical problems, heart disease, asthma, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, other lung diseases, and strokes. So when we look at the adverse effects of tobacco on multiple sclerosis, we know that smokers are much more likely to develop antibodies to decrease the effectiveness of some of our medications, specifically our interferons and Tysabri. An antibody to a medication means that your body has developed a tolerance to that medication. So we're giving you a medication and it may not be working. Um, so we would like that not to happen. So again, if you're smoking, you are increasing the risk of reducing the effectiveness potentially of your medication. We also know it increases the risk of you developing a more progressive MS. We, there are clinical studies that have proven this and that your disability will be more severe. So I tell persons, if you have relapsing remitting, you are going to be 50% closer to getting secondary progressive or primary progressive if you continue smoking. We know that the symptoms of MS are worsened by smoking. So your fatigue will be worse, your pain will be worse, your cognition will be worse, your bladder problems will be worse, we know that. So essential for optimizing your health is you must stop smoking. That is an absolute must. So there are lots of ways in Florida that you can quit smoking. There's the Florida um, quit line. There's aids to help. I tell persons, please see your primary care doctors, see your health clinics. There are ways to help stop smoking. It's extremely important. So let's look at alcohol. Studies report that excessive consumption of alcohol occurs in 15 to 40 percent of persons who have multiple sclerosis. And there is mixed data as to what alcohol does to MS. So we don't have as clear data about all the data I gave you for smoking. We don't have as clear data on alcohol and MS. But we know as far as when I say excessive alcohol consumption, what does that mean? Well, 
for a woman who is not pregnant, greater than or equal to one drink a day is excessive. So if you have a drink every single night, that's excessive. Men, greater or equal than two drinks a day. What I didn't put up here is that it, at least we know for strokes, binge drinking is as harmful as excessive consumption. So binge drinking means I don't drink every single day, but every time I do, maybe it's only once a week. I drink until I'm, I'm drunk as a skunk and somebody else to help me get into the house. Or I drink beyond my ability to control myself. So when you think about one drink, what does that mean? I've put the equivalents down here for what one drink means. So you could have five ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer, or 1.25 ounces of an 80 proof liquor. So that's what one drink is considered. So when you think about alcohol and MS, most of the medications that we are giving persons, at least as far as symptom management medications, have effects of sedation and affect the chemicals in your brain. So alcohol can impair how they work. Also, alcohol is absorbed and ridded through your body from your liver. Many of the drugs, the disease-modifying drugs that we give persons are excreted through your liver. So if you're having problems with your disease-modifying drug, is it your disease-modifying drug or do you need to stop drinking some alcohol so that your liver enzymes go down? So again, that's something to consider. We know that alcohol can worsen MS symptoms like fatigue, cognition, coordination, walking difficulties, reaction times, falls, worsening bowel and bladder dysfunction, and mood disorders. And it may be obvious for you to think, well, yeah, when I'm impaired, I'm going to be more tired. But do you know what? It's not only when you're impaired. It happens the day after, too you're more tired. Yes, when you're impaired, your walking is gonna be more difficult, coordination is gonna be a problem, but guess what? That can happen the day after when you're not impaired too. So again, it's not just while you're under the influence, it can happen the day after too. So we know that alcohol increased the risk of other medical problems. You have a, a, an enormous medical problem that we know that this disease can be progressive. I say can be progressive because many of our disease modifying therapies are, are very effective, but the course of the diseases is typically progressive. So you do not need any other medical conditions. So you need to stay healthy. So you don't want to be consuming alcohol and increasing your risk for triglycerides. Triglycerides are bad cholesterol. You don't want that. You don't want to have high blood pressure. You don't want to get cancers. You don't want to have digestive problems. You surely don't want to be malnourished because you need all the muscles you can have to be able to be strong. If you're malnourished, that also causes peripheral nerve problems. So people who have peripheral nerve problems have significant balance problems. So is it the balance problem from a lesion in your brain or from the peripheral nerve? So you don't want to have that happen to you. You don't want to have liver problems. You don't want us to have to exclude a good percentage of medications because you have liver problems. And alcohol increases the risk of suicide. Again, this is not only while you're impaired. More often, suicides occur when persons are not impaired. Um, so again, um, and then the risk of death from accidents, and that more often is while you're impaired. So extremely important. So let's talk about diet, dietary supplements, and weight management. You know, I define nutrition for persons because sometimes persons don't know that nutrition really means nourishment. It's the food that organisms and your cells need to stay alive. It's the consumption and utilization of foods to maintain optimum health. So when we look at a healthy diet, it's not about necessarily counting calories or measuring portions or cutting carbs or doing all these things. It's really about what and how much you eat. So variety, proportionality, and moderation. I always refer persons to the mypyramid.gov. It's very simple, very easy to use, a good way to help you figure out what a healthy diet might be. 
So persons ask me, did my diet cause my MS? Well, we're learning more about things in your diet that may, but at this moment, I can't say your diet caused MS. Is there a diet that I can say will cure MS? We are learning more and more about things that will help your MS through diet, but I, at this moment, don't have a cure by diet. And I know that persons every day bring me something about I read this and this person is doing it. So again, at this point, I don't have a, a good study that says that. Multivitamins are good for me. That's a myth. Not all multivitamins are good for you. Supplements can't hurt me. Things that I can get over the counter can't hurt me. That true, that is also a myth. So we do know through research that more plant-based, high fiber, less fat, and less salt foods are better for persons who have MS. We are learning that regular routine fast do decrease the immune reaction. And what do I mean by fast? A day of not eating. That's a fast. Some people cannot go a whole day without eating. So if you can't, then a day of much lower um, caloric intake. So days where you don't consume as much. Um, and I'm not saying to do that for long periods of time. A day is good enough. Maintaining your ideal body weight is extremely important, and we know that. We know that persons who are obese at adolescence have a higher risk of developing multiple sclerosis. We know that persons who have MS, obesity makes it much harder for you to function, makes your symptoms worse. So maintaining a normal ideal body weight. Now with electronic medical records um, and how um, these records um, talk to us, we are constantly telling persons about their ideal body weight because it comes up in, in most EMRs as a flag that something that um, every healthcare provider is supposed to talk to someone about based off of their body weight. Um, and just to let you know, this is for normal individuals. As you get a little bit older, if your body weight is between 18 and 24.9, you might be told by your healthcare provider that you're underweight because as you get older, the BMI changes to allow you to go up to a BMI of 2021 20, sometimes. So again, that's just something to consider. Um, and we know that obesity, in addition to making your MS symptoms worse, will make other medical conditions worse. So as Dr. Steingo talked about the importance of vitamin D, we do recognize the extreme importance of vitamin D. We know that the human requirements for vitamin D are much higher than we previously thought. We know that getting vitamin um, D through our diets is very hard to do. Um, and getting sunshine for persons who have multiple sclerosis is sometimes very hard to do because of the heat. But we also believe that persons who have multiple sclerosis have an impaired way of assimilating vitamin D because it's very hard for us with persons who have multiple sclerosis to get their vitamin Ds to a, a good range. Um, so optimally, we want persons' vitamin Ds to be, according to the CMSC, 70. I like to keep persons somewhere between 60 and 100. It is very hard to make persons toxic on vitamin D. We will need to monitor your blood because it is a fat soluble vitamin. And depending upon the pharmacist you go to, I may get calls from pharmacists almost every other day about I'm prescribing too much vitamin D. I'm like, don't worry, I'm monitoring their vitals, which is their lab signs. Um, but the other thing is I'm hearing from some people that insurance companies don't cover vitamin D. And so, Again, if you're having a problem with something that's necessary for you, make sure that you have that discussion with your healthcare provider because it may take me a lot of letter writing. Um, I've written as many as five letters for just vitamin D on one person, but um, ultimately um, I, I have a good record of prevailing, but it does take some effort. So please make sure that you talk with your healthcare provider about that. And in the interim, um, there's over the counter vitamin D. You can take three or four or five pills, whatever a day. Vitamin C. 
We know that vitamin C does stimulate T cells and macrophages. Um, vitamin C is one of those immune boosting vitamins. Your immune system is not deficient. Your immune system is just confused. Your immune system has all the right players, but it's doing the wrong thing. It thinks your central nervous system is part of the problem, so you don't need to stimulate your immune system. So we're giving you drugs to try to modify, try to keep your immune system quiet, and you could be doing the opposite. So um, again, vitamin C, I don't recommend persons take vitamin C. Does that mean you cannot enjoy any of the Florida oranges or grapefruit or citrus that we have? No, I'm talking about supplementation. I'm not talking about what you get in your diet. Um, so better than um, vitamin C for UTIs, try cranberries, okay? Um, and there has been no study that really proves that vitamin C will reduce your risk of getting the common cold or other viruses, so that's a myth. Vitamin B12 deficiencies we know can cause white matter lesions, not only in the brain, but in the spinal cord. We know that it can cause balance and sensory problems, cause anemia and fatigue. So vitamin B12 is something that I supplement on a regular basis. There is no evidence other than in a very rare population of persons that have hematological diseases that this is harmful in individuals. It's a um, water-soluble vitamin, so it's excreted through the urine. So if you take too much vitamin B12, you're going to have nice, you know, pretty yellow urine. Um, but it's typically not harmful, and so it's not something that I um, withhold from individuals. And persons oftentimes will ask me, well, is one vitamin B12 better than another? Should I get a shot, or should I take it sublingual, or should I take the capsules? Um, it all depends upon your gut. If we check your vitamin D level, I mean vitamin B12 level, and your vitamin B12 level is adequate or slightly low, that means your gut is most likely able to absorb vitamin B12, and so therefore we don't have to give you shots. So sublingual or um, tablets would be sufficient, but again, it's a matter of checking your level. So omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. We know that they do have some mild immunosuppressive effects. There has not been a clinical study um, significant for us to say that it can be considered a disease-modifying medication. We know that these are um, rippled with problems with interactions with anticoagulant medications, antiplatelet medications, persons who are on diabetic medications, insulin, and some antihypertensive medications. So this is, should be something that you do in conjunction with um, discussing this with possibly your cardiologist um, or your primary care doctor. So the other thing is to combat the bleeding problems if you are on omega-3 is vitamin E, and we know that vitamin E does increase macrophages and T cells, so that's something to consider. Um, CoQ10 is um, an antioxidant. Most antioxidants have immune stimulating properties. So we don't have enough data to say that whether or not this would be good for MS at all. And there's potential that it might be harmful. So I usually don't ask persons to take CoQ10. Um, and we know that it can cause liver toxicity. And again, most of our medications go through the liver, so we don't really need to be worried about that. Caffeine I put here as um, a dietary supplement because it is something that you can consume um, and it may help with your fatigue. No, if you consume caffeine to help with your fatigue, you need to do it 30 to 45 minutes before you need to really be alert. It's not gonna, you're not gonna drink caffeine and be alert right um, next right after that. Um, but also know that there are several problems with doing that. It has a diuretic effect. So it makes you want to pee more. It also is a, an irritant to your bladder. So in addition to it causing the um, fluid to be going into your bladder, it then irritates your bladder to want to spasm and can cause um, persons to have um, urinary problems like incontinence. It also increase, increases the risk for osteoporosis. So um, caffeine with moderation is probably the best, um, not over consuming. Um, and so for persons who have read some of the gut um, microbiome studies, they're saying no more than two cups of caffeine um, in the form of coffee a day um, is recommended. 
So when we look at salt intake, we know that salt also is one of these um, things that we are finding more about how salt can actually make your MS symptoms worse and can actually um, potentially be one of those triggers for MS. So general person should not have more than 2,300 milligrams of sodium in their diet. So we like persons who have MS to actually have a lower sodium diet. So I tell persons, look, just shop on the outside of your grocery stores, um, eat more fresh things, don't add salt to any of your food, don't eat a lot of processed foods or canned foods, and that typically will keep you in a lower salt range unless you're a high dairy consumer. Um, milks and dairy products have a lot of salt in them. Um, and know that um, salt can increase your risk for other medical problems like hypertension, cardiac disease, uh, vascular disease, kidney problems, and diabetes. So now we're gonna move on to physical activity. It's a proven fact that regular, moderate physical exercise benefits cognition, physical function, and psychological function. That's proven. Benefit is achieved by increasing your heart rate and increasing your respiratory rate. All exercise provides benefit. Um, and benefits are magnified by the amount of regular exercise you incorporate into your daily routine. So if you exercise, give yourself a pat on the back. The more you do, the more pats you get on the back, the more potential, but any exercise is good. So let's talk about the things that we know fit, um, physical activity will do for us. We know it reduces heart disease, it decreases blood pressure, increases your HDL, which is your good cholesterol. It will help with weight control, it decreases brain atrophy. We actually have seen that that can actually enlarge your hippocampus, which is um, part of your memory. Um, centers and can improve mood. When we look at preventative health, we know that physical activity can help prevent diabetes, strokes, certain cancers, osteoporosis, cognitive loss, depression, and chemical dependency. Physical activity is extremely important in helping with um, tobacco, alcohol, and drug use. So when you're talking about physical activity, I tell persons be committed to the process. Be committed to I am going to exercise more. Choose an exercise at your activity level. If you have never run before, don't say I'm going to run tomorrow and I'm going to run. You know, don't do that. Um, look at adaptive classes or adaptive ways of doing things. So we could all exercise in our chairs tonight. You know, lifting your leg up and down like that, that's exercise. Bringing your arm up and down, that is exercise. So when you talk about weights, circuit weights, so you could go to a gym and, and, and use weights. Um, you could do free weights. Do you know free weights is list, lifting this um, program this controller here that's a weight it weighs something and lifting my arm that is a weight so you could lift the water pitchers on your table and that's weightlifting so you can be creative about what you do you do not have to go to a gym aerobic activity is extremely important so doing some aerobic activity aerobic activity is not just running or bicycling walking is aerobic activity sitting Watching TV and moving your legs up and down constantly is aerobic activity. Moving your arms up and down like this is aerobic activity. Pace yourself. Again, don't start out by saying, I'm going to do it for 30 minutes if you've never exercised. Pace yourself. Be patient with yourself. Adapt and modify. Time your exercise at the time of day that's right for you. So, if you are a busy individual and mornings is not your best time or you're struggling with fatigue at work, you're not gonna wanna incorporate your exercise first thing in the morning. You might wanna do it later in, or on your way home from work or in the evening. You wanna make sure you're doing it around medication time. So you wanna make sure if you've got problems with spasticity or if you've got pain problems, you wanna have those symptom management medications on board before you start um, your exercise. You wanna think about staying cool throughout your exercising. So hydrating very well. Do you do it indoors? Do you do it outdoors? So you have air conditioning. 
cooling supplies. So, you know, ice. You can just put ice behind your neck or running cold water on your wrist using the vest. Um, the MS Foundation has lots of cooling supplies that you can look at. Fans and spritzers. So little fan and then, you know, they have those nice fans that you can squirt yourself. That's, those are great too. Keep track of your progress. Again, if you exercise in any way, give yourself a pat on the back. If you exercise today for three minutes, write that down. If you're exercised next week for five minutes, that's great. Track your progress. Don't compare yourself to someone else. Compare yourself to you and where you are. Everybody's running their own race. Stretch daily. Cardio is key. Experiment with different types of activity. Make it fun. Again, Think outside the box. Dancing is exercise. Try a class um, and train in burst. So if you think that you can run, go for two minutes going as fast as you can and then slow down and, and walk and then go faster. And, or if you're just walking, try walking and then walk moving your arms and try lifting your legs higher. So try, try to do things a little bit higher in burst and then go back down to a lower level and go back up again. That's extremely important. So now looking at social um, well-being and personal well-being. So I like to talk to persons about building resilience. It's extremely important to build resilience and resilience is the capability of a strained body to recover in size and shape after de um, deformation caused by a comprehensive um, uh, or compressive stress. The ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change is the um, definition of resilience. So what about MS threatens resilience? Well, the fact that this is a neurodegenerative condition that is the hallmark of relapses and disability, the unknown, that threatens um, resilience. The fact that there are other neuropsychological complications that arise from inflammation and demyelination. The fact, again, that this neurodegenerative disease threatens a person's personal autonomy, independence, dignity, and future plans, that threatens resilience. So how can you build resilience? The most important thing is staying hopeful. If you listen to what Dr. Steingo said earlier, where we've been, and where we have been in the last 30 years, the things that we have developed in the ability to monitor MS, the amount of disease modifying therapies that we have now, the amount of research that is being done, this is the time to be hopeful. Back when this was first diagnosed and we went hundreds, but we didn't know anything, but now is the time to be hopeful. Stay involved in your care. Don't put your head in the sand. Be a partner with your healthcare provider. Do not walk in, okay, what you got for me today? Um, develop partnerships again with that healthcare provider. And it's important in that partnership, you're looking for a person who will respect you as an individual, who respects and accepts your right to choose. So again, as Dr. Steingo presented to you, there's all the things to consider. We're gonna present all these things to you, but ultimately, who has MS? I don't have MS. Ultimately, you have MS. So it's being able to help you choose and having someone who will consider your ethnic and cultural aspects, considers your health beliefs and values and respects your confidentiality and focuses truly on your well-being. So other strategies being self-aware, self-regulation, optimism, mental agility, trying to think different ways, building on your character strengths and making connections with others. So what can you do? That's the most important thing. Focus on what can you do. Are you taking medications because or are you taking medications because of what medicines can do for you. Is MS a crisis or an opportunity? You know, we all face something in life and I, I'm not wishing on anyone MS or any other chronic disease, but it's how you look at it. Don't become MS, let you be a person who has MS. Identify things that are predictable and plan for those. Try to take hold of the things that you can control, your diet, 
exercise, sleeping, hydrating, getting support, having the right attitude. Those are things that can help you. So what are some examples? Again, being optimistic, persevering, feeling strong as a person, handling uncomfortable feelings, thinking clearly and logically under pressure, seeing humor in situations, so if something, seeing something funny in it, knowing where and who to go for help, um, generally feeling in control, having a tendency to bounce back after hardships or illnesses, having close dependable relationships, and over time liking challenges, thinking that you can handle these things that I can overcome, and having a sense that things happen for a reason and that you may not be able to make sense of every situation, but you're gonna move in a positive direction. So now let's talk about prevention and management of other medical conditions because other things are much more common than multiple sclerosis and other things will impair your multiple sclerosis. So you should have routine health screenings. You should have annual screenings. And in an annual screening should include depression, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol checking, obesity, sexually transmitted diseases, and immunizations. This should be part of a regular annual exam that these things are checked and monitored. Checking for things like breast cancer, cervical cancer, colon cancer. There's the um, data up here for at what ages you should be doing that. In many instances, this is for healthy individuals, depending upon your family history or depending upon like persons with osteoporosis. With MS, we're checking osteoporosis much earlier than 65, much earlier depending upon persons um, um, steroid history, so um, even you know as early as 40 or in 30s, depending. Hepatitis C, HIV, and lung cancer. Again, depending upon your history, these things may be checked earlier, but these are things that should be part of routine screenings. Vaccines, it's extremely important and necessary for persons to maintain good health for you to get regular vaccines if they are necessary. I used to keep a chart up here for all the vaccines. You know, you can get that from the CDC, what you should get, and it outlines for persons who have medical conditions. But the key is there are certain vaccines that generally we don't recommend for persons who have MS. And so the influenza vaccine comes in two forms. You can get a shot or you can get a nasal. Do not get the nasal if you have MS, because that is a live virus. We do not want to give you a live virus. A live virus is giving you that influenza so that your body will recognize it. You're increasing your immune system to fight off that live virus, and, and that potentially can cause you a relapse. The other live virus vaccines are the zoster vaccines, the varicella vaccine, the measles, mumps, and rubella. So these are live vaccines that are generally not uh, um, given to persons who have multiple sclerosis. Now, I can just see the faces of some of you in the audience and thinking that, well, I should have a varicella. Um, Again, that's something that you and your healthcare provider have to have a discussion about. Yes, there are some disease modifying therapies that they would like you to have had an immunity to this, but you have to have a discussion with your healthcare provider if you do not have proven, because some persons have never had chickenpox but have immunity. But if you're one of those t persons that the blood test says that you've never had chicken pox and you don't have immunity, that's something that you and your healthcare provider are gonna have to talk about, the risk of whether or not you get that vaccine. So that's something individually. So the bottom line is this is a chronic degenerative disease. I like persons to think about the fact that you're a champion every single day that you get up, and this is not a short race. This is a marathon. This is something that you need to strive every day to do the best that you can do. If you don't do everything today, get up tomorrow with a fresh attitude and do the best you can that, that day. Every day, do the best that you can to do the best that you can for your disease. Um, and recruit inside that village 
not only the village of healthcare providers, but the village of persons around you to be helpful and to encourage you. So be around persons that are positive. You don't want the hair um, as your um, team member. You want all the people around here that were cheering on that nice tortoise, okay? So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Tricia. So now we're going to do a Q&A, okay? And what I'm going to do is both of our presenters are going to be up here, and I'm going to go around the room, and I need you to raise your hand. When you want to speak, I'll acknowledge that you want to ask a question, all right? And I will get around the room to see everybody that does have a question. And I do hope that everybody does have a question, okay? Thank you. Trish. Up there, you mentioned about the yearly exams and osteoporosis that we get, knowing that um, most of the doctors are not letting women have it if they are not 65. You know, there are some of those that are 40, 45, 50 that have been falling and breaking bones, and when they've asked to have the bone density or whatever, they're told, no, you're too young how can they really make sure they get you know, diagnosed with their bone density and... Excellent question. So again, I include that in the things that I do with my MS persons that I send to their primary that persons need to have this and I'll ask to have notes from the primary sent back to me. And if their primary care provider is not willing to help out in that regard, I may go as far as ordering the test myself, and then depending upon when the results come back, I am not gonna treat osteoporosis. I'm gonna send those results back to the primary. So most of the time, I don't have problems with primary care doctors when I explain to them, this person has had this much steroids, and this person, and um, so I usually don't have that problem. But again, it's you know having persons communicate with one another, extremely important with communication. So. Um, maybe a primary care provider doesn't know that. So picking up the phone or, again, making sure that we have their name so that our note's going to them. Next question here. Uh, wonderful presentation from you two. Uh, the question is for Dr. Steingo. Uh, what is the real difference or is it known between primary progressive and, sec and um, relapsing remitting? So in relapsing MS, we know there's a lot of inflammation in the brain. And in progressive MS, there's less inflammation and there's more degeneration. It means that cells, brain cells are dying. So early on, there's a lot of inflammation. And as the disease progresses, the inflammation is less and there's more degeneration. That's kind of what we, that's the way we view it right now. And we think it's a spectrum. So that MS starts out that every, everybody with MS has both components. Everybody with MS, if you look at their brains and their spinal cord, everybody has some inflammation and, and some degeneration. Early on in the relapsing people, it's predominantly inflammation. And then later on, there's less inflammation and more degeneration. And in people with degenerative MS, there's a lot, of de a lot more degeneration potentially early on, but even people that have progressive MS where there's some degeneration of the brain, where it's a degenerative disease, there is even in those people some inflammation. And that might be why the drugs, all the drugs that we have for, for relapsing MS, which is an inflammatory disease, a lot of those drugs do not work for progressive MS because it's predominantly a degenerative disease. There's degeneration happening in the brain, like in other degenerative diseases, like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. We call those degenerative diseases where there's degeneration of cells. That's our understanding right now of it. Uh, for both of you, uh, you mentioned about the shingle va vaccine. Is it a live vaccine that we should not have people with MS? It is a live vaccine, yes. Okay. And the other question is, the, uh, you, the doctor, you mentioned about the biotin. That's a B, B vitamin, right? And you mentioned about biotin 100 three times a day? Correct. Okay. So that's the study. So you could look it up. I suggest you do that. Do a search on Google and type in, just type in the words high dose biotin for progressive MS. And you'll see the study which was initiated in France using this very high dose of 100 milligrams three times a day. That study is now being done in many sites in the US as well. 
uh, but sometimes people are not eligible because their criteria for getting in the study are quite strict. So if you can't get in the study, you could potentially get the drug, if you're interested and you read about it and you like what you read, uh, you would then get it from a compounding pharmacist. So your, your uh, practitioner would have to call a compounding pharmacist and get it for you. Question. With all of the new medications that have come out over the last 10 years, 20 years, are we thinking that these are things, are we gearing this toward people that are newly diagnosed or are we thinking that there's going to be help for people that have had MS for 15, 20, 25, 30 years? Well, the, the sad thing is that, you know, as, as we know, the damage to the central nervous system, if it's there, it's permanent. Um, and so the brain and, and spinal cord do have some plasticity. And when you run out of that is when you start having disability. So going forward, we're looking for things that will be neuroprotective for people who are um, having degeneration. And we're also looking for things that will be neuroreparative. But at this point, although some of the newer drugs do talk about an improvement in, in disability, they're not being prescribed for neuro repair. And so for persons who have permanent injury from having MS for 25 years, we really need neuro repair. And that's where I think the, the studies in stem cells and things are, are moving us towards. So I, I'll add a little to that, which is that MS, one of the difficulties about MS is that it is a very unpredictable disease. So two people can start out on the same day and look identical, and five or ten years later, their outcome is completely different. And we don't know about what causes it to be so unpredictable. So that's something that's very un... The only thing about MS that's predictable is that it's unpredictable. So we know that for a fact, how it can vary. The other thing about MS is that things don't always measure up the way we expect them to. You could look at someone's MRI scan, and it looks horrible, and they're doing great. And someone else is much less on their MRI scan, and they're doing terribly. So we don't understand everything there is to know about this disease. But what we do know, though, is a big picture, that, early, that, that, that if the, the disease, as I showed you early on, tends to be a progressive disease. And so therefore, we generally will recommend starting treatment early. Questions over here? Um, actually, what you just said is kind of like what I have a question about. So when you were talking about the number of lesions to start with, you were saying that if you have up to like 10 to start with, you will possibly be using a cane in 15 years. Now, is that information that was like, like researched before all these medications came out? So now all this new medication, is that the same results? So that, that information is obtained from studies that were done those studies that I actually showed were done at, at a very famous neurologic institute in London called Queen, uh, Queen's Square, very famous neurological place. And these are studies that were done before we had these drugs. And so in those days, we knew what would happen if you had no treatment, because there was no treatment. And so that's, those, that's, that's mostly where those studies come from. These are people who are not treated. You look at their scans, there's a bunch of lesions. They don't take treatment, and there's many lesions that we knew that down the road, 10 to 20 years, they'd be using a cane or a walker. So nowadays, with all the new drugs, what they've done, we cannot claim, we do not claim that they're a cure. But what we do with the drugs is we slow down the relapses. We slow down the progression of disability. So if there was a curve over there, it's shifted the curve. That's what we think we've done. We've shifted the curve. So yes, outcomes would be much better with treatment. You were talking about um, ocalizumab. I'm on the study trial, and it's a great drug. The only thing I don't like about it is that I have to do steroids first, and then I get infused. Do you know if when it does come out on market, do I still have to do the steroids? Well, it's, are you doing the trial too? You probably are doing the trial too. You, I'll answer it quickly, okay. Yes, the answer is, so firstly, it's not approved yet. Okay, with the FDA, it's an unpredictable business. It's possible next month, which we, next month we anticipate to be approved. The FDA might say, you know, we need six more months of information. So we don't know exactly what the FDA is going to say, but I suspect it's most likely in the protocol they will do it exactly the same way. This is an infusion. Infusion reactions are possible. We don't want an infusion reaction. They can be very severe, and the way we prevent them is with steroids. So I would say yes, that they're most likely going to be that you do the steroid at the same time with each infusion. 
quick question before I continue with the patients out here. How do you know when a drug is no longer working, and how do you know then, or what would you suggest to patients to get them to the next medication? Yeah, so I talk about the report card for MS. So you know a drug's not working anymore when you're having active disease. So if you're having relapses, if you're having MRI activity, or you're having progression of disability, then your disease-modifying drug is not working. We are striving towards trying to get towards NIDA, which is no evidence of disease activity, so no relapses, no MRI activity, and no disability. Now, there's another phrase that has been coined called MEDA, which is minimal evidence of disease activity. So again, you know, you need to work with your neurologist and um, your nurse practitioner or PA in where you are in that, where you're on your report card. Do you change a drug that you've been on for five years and doing very well because you have no change other than a very small, teeny little um, speck on your MRI that is in an inconsequential place that maybe that could have been from a migraine versus um, MS. So those are things that we are trying to work out in our own minds, but if you have new activity or you cannot tolerate a drug, typically that's where I tell persons you need to be considering that your drug is not working for you anymore. Um, I have another question. Um, it, it seems like there's another, at least to me, that there's another factor besides uh, disease progression or evidence of disease progression because even without the evidence of, of progression, it seems like disability continues uh, to progress. So do you know if, if that is really true or, or is there another factor? Is there a consequence maybe? Well, there is one other factor and that's age. So for any of you who are signed up with the MS Society, they have a quarterly magazine that comes out and they had a great issue, maybe two issues back, on the effect of aging on MS. So if you think about it, all of us have a certain amount of brain cells and as we age, we normally lose some brain cells. But let's say instead of having, when you get to a certain age, instead of having your normal complement of brain cells, you've lost brain cells because of your MS. MS has caused some damage. So now you have less reserve. So the effects of aging could potentially be greater. So one of the factors that, that c contributes to progression of MS patients as they get older is aging. So that is another factor. And it's a factor you, can, you don't want to risk, because if you don't have aging, well, then you're not there. So you don't want that, so you need to do everything you can as you heard earlier, all the things you can do for yourself. I showed you my slide of, of the things you do for yourself, which I wrote in an acronymic form of teams of friends, all the things you need to do for yourself. You had a whole large, a long lecture, uh, beautifully done, on all the things you need to do for yourself, and those are very important. And those, that is not only necessary for people that have MS, that's for everybody, of eating healthy and exercising. So these are things that, that uh, reduce the effect of age, and the effect of age on MS is that it makes it worse. We have an election less than a week away. And one of the things on our ballot here in Florida is legalization of marijuana for medical use. Can each of you give me your opinion about why one should or should not consider it? Okay. Don't jump <laughs> to you first. Well, first, it's not approved in the state of Florida anyway. So there, but there are all kinds of little potions and tinctures and lotions and cookies and candies and things that people are getting and actually bringing to me. Actually, last week I actually got a joint. Somebody brought me a joint. I guess they thought I needed it. They said, you're having a bad day, here's a joint. Um, but it's not, so the two things we know for sure that marijuana helps in MS are pain and spasticity. Those two things studies have shown are of benefit. And going forward in the future, hopefully there'll be some other derivatives, some other cannabinoids, we call them, that will be more specific and improve our pain and improve spasticity without causing the mental high and the mental side effects. But what we do know about marijuana in long-term use is that it does impair cognitive function. So several very good studies have shown that. So now we have a balance. We can improve pain and we can improve spasticity, 
but it can affect cognitive function, which is a major problem for people with MS. So we have to weigh up all the pros and cons. And so my balance is that use it carefully like you should everything else. Some people have bad spasticity at night, bad pain at night. Maybe they could take some form of it at night to help that, but not on a regular basis. So that right now is our outlook. In the future going forward, I think cannabinoids, some different varieties of it will be available, and maybe we can modify it to help with pain and spasticity without having adverse effects on mental behavior and, and memory and things like that. That's, that's my take. Well, I, I agree with those sentiments that the um, oils and different specificities of the marijuana may be helpful, but the generic joint um, is not. And, you know, it doesn't feel right when I have a person who won't try something that's been proven to help with pain or spasticity and not have some of these other side effects, but we'll do this. Um, the other thing I know is it's, I am not going to be able to prescribe it. As a nurse practitioner in this state, I can't prescribe controlled substances except for seven days. If I chose to go through this long, long thing to get certified to do that, I still am only get the license to do it for seven days. So I don't have a license to prescribe controlled substances. The this, this state regulations for us prescribing regular controlled substances is not doable in our practice, so we're gonna send persons to pain management, and when these drugs have such um, effects on individuals, I think they should be managed by another physician. So I'm not against it, but will I be prescribing it? No. I think her question, though, also pertains to that. If it is approved, what would you do? Would you prescribe it or not, if it is approved? I'd send a person to a pain management specialist. Yeah, I think they, will, they are going to be, they are going to require us probably to be certified or trained, and there'll be certain people who are trained, more trained than others to do this. Well, regardless of whether or not it's approved, there's two components to marijuana, and that is THC and CBD. Now, THC is where you get the buzz, and I don't know if people are just hoping to get a quick buzz and feel better, but... The CBD part is legal now. You can, that's brought in normally legally into this country, and you can buy it right now. It's not a controlled substance, and I happen to get it, and I take it. And I take it two times a day, a quarter a teaspoon of the oil. Um, and it helps me completely with my leg spasms, almost immediately. When my legs start to spasm, I take it. But you can buy CBD pills, you can buy CBD oil, you can buy CBD tincture. Just gotta find a reliable place to get it from. But you don't need the THC component to make yourself feel better or to get relief, you can get it in the CBD and not in the, the THC. And the only reason I know that is because I just spent two months in Southern Cal and there's pot places all over the place and I had extensive conversations with the people there and all that, so. Okay, so next question. With the talk of stem cell therapy and what is out there for that and the talk about Alamtuzumab or Lamitrata. Can you tell everybody what is involved with the reboot of both? I mean, it's, it's completely different. So with, with stem cells, we harvest the patient's own stem cells, and then we take them and prepare them and freeze them. So we have your own stem cells frozen in a freezer. Then we give you chemotherapy of one type or another. So stem cell treatments have become much better over the years. If you go back many years ago, they were very destructive. There was either, either we give people chemotherapy or, ir or radiation to their, to their bone marrow and wipe out their bone marrow. And many people would die from this. The mortality rate was high. Now we are using chemotherapy in a much more controlled fashion, so the results are much better. But there still is a risk that people can get serious infections. Because after we take the stem cells, we kill your own bone marrow, we destroy it, then put the stem cells back in you and they have to regenerate. And so they go and they migrate to the bone marrow and regenerate your immune system. So that's what we're doing with stem cell therapy right now is regenerating the immune system. That's primarily what stem cell therapy does. So with Lemtrada though, what Lemtrada does is that it kills certain types of white blood cells that are called lymphocytes. It doesn't destroy your entire bone marrow. It only destroys the lymphocytes. The rest of the bone marrow is largely still intact. So in, a, in, in that part, those lymphocytes are actually going to regenerate and maybe so that part of, the, of your immune system may then 
become restored or rebooted. So in a way, it's doing something similar, trying to restore a part of your bone marrow, but not as intensively or to the same extent as a stem cell would do. Biomarkers. Are there anything, is there anything happening with biomarkers to determine what a patient should be taking as far as medication or not as they go forward? I mean, there's studies that are published periodically here and there. There have been biomarkers where they said they showed interferons, would or would not work, or copaxone. Uh, the, only, the only marker really that we have right now is JC virus is a biomarker. JC virus is a biomarker for somebody on Tysabri that tells us if they're on Tysabri and their JC virus is positive, they're at risk. So that, would, that is an example of a biomarker. It's a biological marker of something. But other than that, I don't know of any others. I don't know if you know. Well, we consider the CMSC a biomarker is the MRI. Um, so that is considered a biomarker that we have now is the MRI. <clears throat> Speaking about MRI, people have been asking if they should use 3T or just the 1.5 if 3T is showing more now. And can you explain what I'm talking about so they know what I'm saying about 3T? So 3T is the strength of the magnet. Three Teslas, the strength of the magnet. The higher the number on the magnet, the better resolution. So a 1.5 has half the resolution strength of a 3T. If you go to an open MRI, you're looking at like maybe a 0.75. So if you don't have any hardwire or any reason why you cannot have a 3T, I tell persons that's the standard for MS. You should get a 3T. If you're comparing that to your previous MRI that was a 1.5, there's going to need to be some adjustment looking for potentially lesions may be more visible because it's a better picture. Um, and is it possible that we may see a lesion that we say wasn't there on the previous, but really it was, we just couldn't see it because the MRI was not as good a quality. But you have to make that leap up and get the best image you can. How many people are watching black and white TV? There you go. You've all moved up to color television. You probably all have moved from the um, old color TVs where now you probably have a digital one. So it's moving up in the technology, so to speak, of how well the picture looks. Think of, I'm an older woman. I remember when I had an ultrasound for my child. Children, there were two in there. Boy, they look so different. Now I see women that have these 3D ultrasounds. It's the difference in the clarity of how well we can see. And if we can see so much better with a 3, and that costs the same as a 1.5, why would you not want that? If you can get a Porsche for the same price that you can get a Chevy, wouldn't you want to drive the Porsche? You're going to pay the same thing. The key is using comparison. So you have to have the MRI you had before compared to the next one. So comparing and trying to get the best picture. I tell persons I'd be happy to sedate persons to give them a closed 3T magnet versus a 1.5 or an open magnet. Most of the 3Ts are also bigger bore machines, so they're larger. Your head is going to be cradled so that you can't move your head around, but the machine itself is very large and roomy. So although you can't move your head around and you may think you're in the whole machine because it's making so much noise, you're really not. So there's other techniques. Most of the imaging centers have um, headphones that they can give you or earplugs. Um, so there's ways to get around getting a good MRI. Any other questions? If not, let's thank our presenters. <laughs> thank you again, both of you. For anybody, well, you're all going to be leaving. Please remember to fill out your seminar evaluation forms. Bring them out to <clears throat> Jill on the way out. I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> also, please remember that uh, we want to thank Santa Fe Genzyme for giving us the funding again to do today's program. So I want to thank them, and I hope you all do too. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody.